Hello, good evening, and welcome to A Night In with William Boyd in partnership with Penguin Live to discuss his latest novel trio and his full body of work, I hope. Uh, I know we're in for a treat. Uh, I'm Mick Brown. I'm a writer for The Daily Telegraph. Uh, and as this event is exclusively for Telegraph subscribers, uh, we've also got a spoiler alert. Um, I need to warn you that there could be spoilers in this conversation, but please don't switch off your sets. Um, there are few more reliable literary pleasures than a William Boyd novel. Over four decades, Will has established himself as one of Britain's preeminent, most popular and highly regarded novelists and an unparalleled storyteller. I'm sure we all have at least one William Boyd novel in our top 10. Uh, I know I have, and I've no doubt we'll be talking about that one a little later on and covering all of Will's life and work up to his most recent novel, which is another delight uh, as, as good, as dependable, and as thoroughly enjoyable as ever. Uh, and that's called Trio. So without further ado, I'd like to invite William Boyd to join me here on stage. Hello. Hello, Will. <laughs> oh, that's a relief. Yes, that's, that's, <laughs> technology works. Um, fantastic. Um, very, well, ha very happy to be here. Delighted. Well, we're very delighted to have you and, and lovely to see you. Um, I assume you're, you're sitting in your, you must be sitting in your study there. I'm, I'm just knocked out by, by, the, uh, yeah, by the, the, the pyramidal style of uh, pile of books behind you. It's extraordinary. What, what, are those for a new work in progress? Um, no, this is just the, the terrible state of my book storage problem. Uh, luckily, you can't see the rest of the study. It's even worse. That's the, that wall is sort of semi-presentable. Now, my problem is that um, whenever I'm working on a project, whether it's a novel or a television series or a film, I like to acquire a, a, li a little library of books that serve that project. It's, just, it's because I'm still basically an analog person, I suppose, and I, I like to be able to pick up a book and dip into it or go to the index. Um, mm. and, uh, and because I'm a writer of fiction, it's, you're like a magpie. It's what catches your eye. It's not, you know, I'm not a historian or a, or a serious journalist. So um, if, I, if I buy a book on, you know, men's underwear in the 18th century, um, I will leaf through it and find a, an interesting nugget of fact and uh, it'll find its way into the novel. But I need to have the book in order to do that. Hence this mm -hmm. appalling, the appalling state of my study. And what's behind me is actually uh, the books on about um, three or four TV projects that I'm you know, struggling with or trying to write yeah. or so on. But, uh, that, but uh, I apologize for the, the disarray. <laughs> Well, don't apologize. But if, I mean, well, one of one of the great pleasures of, of of your work for me is is the feeling of absolute authenticity that comes across about whatever period you're writing about and whatever milieu you're writing about. So, if you are writing about men's underwear in the 18th or 19th century, one can rely on the fact that it's absolutely accurate, and you've done your research. I mean, you, you I, I sense that you absolutely love the research. This is one of the things that you most enjoy about uh, about your writing. Really. Yes, I do, absolutely. I mean, I have written novels that are set, you know, today, absolutely contemporary. I just need to look hmm. out the window to do my research. But um, I, I am a realistic novelist, fundamentally. And, and if I was a painter, I'd be a figurative painter, not an abstract painter. And so, the worlds of the of my novels or my fictions, I think, have to be as real as possible, and it's all to do with texture and detail and selection of detail that uh, does a lot of work for you. That makes that world you're creating absolutely come alive, and so readers, um, in a way, relax because um, the the kind of um, as you say, the authenticity, the plausibility of this fictional world that I'm presenting is um, you know thoroughly documented and you know texturally there so it's a very mm. important thing part of my writing practice mm. so trio the, the the new novel is is set in brighton would you have spent quite a while wandering around the lanes and wandering along the seafront and sort of uh, getting a sense of the geography and the feel of the place albeit what it might have felt like in 1968 yeah i, I know brighton quite well i've been there a lot i have uh, I have very good friends who live there um and uh, Br brighton in 1968 um i apologize to any brightonians who may be tuning in but that was the period when the, the town center of town started to be destroyed so the old brighton of, of my novel is still just about there and um so i actually 
wandering around Brighton today wasn't that useful. What I did do is buy lots of photographs or books of photographs of Brighton, uh-huh. at Brighton as it was. And I find photographs very useful and I kind of pour over them with a magnifying glass. It's astonishing what details you can unearth from the background of a photograph. Um, mm. and, 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 and so I acquainted myself with, with that Brighton of, you know, 50 odd years ago, you know, so it's, it's ancient history in a way. But the, there's still a lot of the old, the old town there, the old city there. But um, it was a, a, an, an effort of, you know, teletransportation in a way to recreate the, the 1968 version. Right. I mean, it's, it's set, as I say, in 1968, and, and it revolves around uh, th- three stories, basically, connected by the Brighton production of this, of this, if I may say, frankly, terrible sounding film called... Uh, Emily Bracegirdle's extremely useful ladder to the moon. That, that's that's quite a mouthful. Yes. Um, one, one of the great pleasures for me in, in your writing, and one thing I always marvel at, is, is, is your capacity to imagine and enter into completely different worlds in, in all your novels and take, take, take us with you there as if, as if leading, leading us by the hand, as it were. So what's the germ of that process? What, where, why Brighton? Why this film production why these characters what's the germ of that process for you well it actually started with a a, a kind of experiment that I had in mind I I wanted to write three short stories um, that you could read in any order and they would work like story one two and three could start with three go to one and then read two and you you could start with two and read three and go back to one and uh, uh, the reader would choose which which order to read the stories in um, and I, f- I figured out that the way to do this was in each story to have a secret. And so I got very interested in this idea of people's secret lives. And then I realized that my very smart, clever, clever, clever idea was something of a gimmick. So I abandoned my very clever, you know, do it yourself narrative uh, notion. And uh, but the idea stayed with me. So I thought I'll write a novel about th- three people, all of whom have a secret that they're guarding and their or their secret lives are very ring fenced. And, um, and then you, my, the way I work right is I, I don't start until I've figured out the entire novel. So mm. I, I, and so I ask myself a series of questions and the answers I get to those questions provoke more questions and so on. So the first thing was like, where will this novel be set? Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and I, I thought I'm not going to set it in London because I've written London novels. Um, and I thought, uh, for some reason, Brighton popped into my head, possibly because of its its reputation as a, a slightly loose and racy place. Uh, and then I thought, what are, the, my <laughs> yeah, so what, are the, what are these people doing? And so, I mean, I've been writing films and television for as long as I've been writing novels. So I know that world incredibly well. Um, and there's something, you know, you know, fundamentally rackety and fragile and risky about uh, a, a, a film being made and that sort of suited the the 1960s vibe which was another decision I made when would it be set and I decided to set it in this sort of pivotal watershed year of 1968 a bit like 2020 in a way I think it was a year when people felt the world was you know going to hell in a handcart and uh, not because of a pandemic but because of events you know the the vietnam war was raging uh, at its most severe um the tet offensive had started off in january um in in mexico and paris and germany and italy there were massive social revolutions you know the events of may in paris the kind of french revolution of the 20th century uh, martin luther king was assassinated and, and america saw the biggest uh, riots and civil disobedience since the civil war uh, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. And then in August, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. And I, th- I think if, if you know, I was alive and I was 16 years old, but the, the world was in a terrible state, except, mm. except in Great Britain, where mm. we were having a good time partying and listening to music and, and getting stoned. You know? So it was um, a very curious bubble that we were in. And somehow Brighton a very silly movie we were making a lot of very silly movies at the time as well and believe you me my title is no stupider than some of the other authentic titles <laughs> you know, here's one for 30 is a dangerous age cynthia that's a real uh, film yeah, yeah. I remember or, it well. yes or um um how hieronymus merkin uh can hieronymus merkin uh, 
find mercy hump and find true happiness or something like these very silly cool zany films were being made and it sort of reflected the mood of the country i think at the time whereas in the rest of the world everyone was very grim faced and serious yeah, yeah. film titles actually reflecting also the names of pop groups at the time which were also sort of slightly outlandish. Yes, yes, and exactly. Delian Chariot, the incredible string band. You know, yes, it, yes. It's uh, uh, it was a kind of you know. It was, I think zany is a, is a, is a good word to describe the mood at the time. You know, and uh, yeah. and that little moment in British film history, which sort of started in sixty five or sixty four, with I think the Beatles film A Hard Day's Night, uh, right. and e and ended in nineteen seventy with uh, the release of Performance, starring Mick Jagger, it was a much darker. Uh, mm -hmm. story altogether but in those five years there were a lot of incredibly silly you know funny films made and so it's a little little moment in British film history that I wanted to celebrate mm. and uh, hence uh, Emily Bracegirdle's extremely useful ladder to the moon right <laughs> ladder to the moon or ladder 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean as you say a, a film set is is a particularly uh appropriate place you might say uh to to, to bring together characters because it, it's very explosive isn't it all sorts of things happen people are brought together for a very short period of time so uh, tempers can become volatile uh, lust can arise it, it it it's a very volatile and very um uh very evocative sort of environment was that something that also appealed to you that you could you could you could, you could explore all of these different emotional resonances within these characters yeah, within this yes. very short period of time <clears throat> Absolutely, you've got very, very powerful characters, very, very um, extravagant egos all coming to to this one place. But the other thing about uh, making a film, it's so easy for things to go wrong. You know, it just starts right. pour, just starts pouring with rain, for example, um, or <clears throat> some, uh, some crucial uh, piece of equipment breaks down, and the whole film is threatened, and schedules are thrown out the window. So there's a kind of you know herding cats aspect about making a uh, any movie of any size and it's very very easy for things to go hideously wrong so there's this kind of undercurrent of tension and uh, mm. and this kind of desperate uh, effort to preempt problems which often goes wrong but in 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 my film in in, in ladder to the moon things go spectacularly wrong um uh, but it's not untypical you know um uh actors have died halfway through films you know and uh, <laughs> and uh, money money that was promised never shows up um, yeah, I've, I, I've had so many uh, weird and bizarre experiences in the in the films that uh, I've been involved with that um, you know I could write a book about them so right. Judy did right. <clears throat> right I was gonna say you put yeah. a, lot of, I mean, a lot of them into this as you say it's it, w one of the central themes is is secret lives private lives hidden lives Hidden identities as well, changes of identity. We've, we've, we've got um, Reg, the film director, who wants to be known as Rodrigo. Uh, and film, of course, is, is a place of fantasy, a place where people invent themselves, are reinvented, where, 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 where new identities are, are, are sort of born. And I, I suppose one of the great beauties of being a novelist is that you have the opportunity to adopt any number of identities for yourself, that you can, on one day, you can be in this case, the producer. On another day, you can be Annie, the actress. Uh, is that one of the is that one of the pleasures of writing that you can you can lose yourself in these characters and become these characters? Yes, I think it is. I think there is a um, you know there is a, a real pleasure in imagining other lives and imagining um, other personalities and exploring you know um, real scumbags and and also um, very nice people. Um, I think more seriously, though, there's something that the novel does, which I think is uh, unique and which explains a lot of its power, that only in fiction can we, as readers, gain access to the interior lives of other people. Uh, other mm. people are fundamentally mysterious, even the people who are closest to you. You never know exactly what somebody else is thinking, even if they claim to be telling you what they're thinking. Um, there is a there is a preserve, if you like. There is a, an area of absolute privacy in everybody, and uh, it's it's you know it's fascinating and frustrating. But you can find out uh, what Elizabeth Bennet actually thinks of Mister Darcy if you read Pride and Prejudice, and this is an access that the novel gives 
everybody into the in, in, inner interior life of people. And that is something that's denied us in the real world. And so I think mm. as part of the intense pleasure of reading a novel, you know, you, you actually do know what makes these characters tick in a way mm. you don't in the real world. And of course, as a creator of the characters, I get, uh, um, you know, I get to have my cake and eat it and that I can be everybody in a novel and can and can occupy their interior lives and and you know expose them to the reader so it's a um, mm. i think it's something that's struck me rec more recently i've just thought about the novel and what it does and, and and what it offers people and i do think fundamentally it's this access to the secret lives of human beings even though paradoxically they're fictitious beings that's true, and 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 the the interior lives of all of us. Because one of the great pleasures of, of reading a novel and reading reading your novels, is identification with the characters. And characters sometimes speak truths which were about ourselves that we haven't been able to articulate to ourselves, or they live through experiences that we may be experiencing, troubles, yeah. for example, or or, or or moments of great joy. So I think that sense of identification is one of the key things for me in, 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 in the novels that I enjoy. I mean, it's often said, isn't it, that, that, that novels can reach a greater truth than nonfiction can. I'm not sure I've ever quite understood what that means, but can you can you well, do yeah, that? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think I can explain it because I think, um, you know, if you think of other, uh, other ways of writing about a life, um, biography or autobiography, for example, um, there's something very shaped and selective about that, the presentation of that particular life, however exhaustive and however big the biography is. And um, um, you don't know what Anton Chekhov thought when he decided not to get married to this particular woman. You can have a stab at guessing at it. So I think it comes back to this idea that people are opaque and people are mysterious and motives are can be multifaceted or, or ultimately unknowable. Uh, and But the, the, again, the paradox is worth restating that but if you go to read a novel or a short story, um, you don't have that doubt because the author guarantees the absolute veracity of what he's telling you. Uh, and mm -hmm. if the author is good and if the, if the work is serious, then, I, then I, I think you do gain a sense of what other people are like through, you know, uh, clever and authentic and realistic fiction so i think it's um it's some something that's buried within the various you know power and allures of the novel but for me more and more it's there's this sense that that is what people get from fiction even you know even you know beach blanket bestsellers or genre fiction but that somehow it explains uh other people to our, ourselves and i think that's very important is that is that what struck you when you first started reading seriously? I mean, when you were when you were a teenager, but could be before a teenager, perhaps. I mean, the novels that 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 took you into another world. What were those novels? And is that the feeling that you had, perhaps not articulated in the way you just articulated yeah. it now? But is that the feeling you had when you were that age that these yeah. are taking into worlds that that <clears> I can. <throat> Some I can recognise, and some of which are, are, are just extraordinary to me. Yeah, I think I think the first reaction. This is true of me. Is is um, when you're reading as a you know I was maybe fourteen or fifteen, when you when you have a feeling of empathy. And I remember exactly when it happened to me. It was a a, a sequence of short stories by Scott Fitzgerald, which are known collectively as the Basil Duke Lee stories. And they're about this boy, this teenage boy, Basil Duke Lee, very closely modelled on Fitzgerald himself. They're not particularly well known in his work but uh, when I read them when I was 14 or 15 and because the central character is 14 or 15 I was struck not knowing who Scott Fitzgerald was that this this author clearly knows what's going on in the head of a 14 year old boy because I reckon <laughs> I recognize these sentiments and these feelings and these frustrations and that, and that made me go and read more Scott Fitzgerald and I think mm. that's a great uh, portal into reading in a way this sense of empathy and actually when i was uh you know struggling to become a writer i, I had this idea of compiling an anthology of fiction about adolescence you know about you know teenage boys and teenage girls and i compiled a you know about, an example about 30 stories that were all about you know young people 13 to 18 you know classic uh classic writers and lesser known writers and it was really a, a response to this my own experience of 
how I became engaged with reading, you know, great fiction or great novels mm. or, or art. It was a, a, a feeling of empathy that this is a world I, I, uh, I recognize as being true. I mean, there's another very good example. There's a novel by an Irish writer uh, called Joyce Carey, which is mm. called, called Mr. Johnson. Uh, and it's set in Nigeria, it's a country I grew up in, Nigeria. And by by sheer coincidence, we ha we had a cook uh, called Mr. Johnson <laughs> in our house. And I picked this book out and I, re I started reading it. I must have been 15 or 16, purely because of the association. But it's a fantastic novel about Nigeria, set in the 1920s. But again, it was describing a life I recognized and I could... I could vouch for, if you like. And I thought, yes, this is what it's like on a hot day when you're walking on a road and feeling thirsty. And Joyce Carey had nailed it. <clears throat> and I think again mm -hmm. and again, that's the first recognition. Then it becomes more sophisticated mm -hmm. and uh, they were more nuanced, if you like. But uh, initially, there's a, it's a feeling of, yes, this is true. Uh, yes, this happened to me. Um, I believe this. And that's what takes you further down the road of literature. I think there must have been an enormous uh, pang of, of, of identification, realization for many, many teenagers when they first read Catcher in the Rye. I mean, that's the novel. Yes, exactly. Movie. Exactly. A very good example. Yes. That um, sense, of, uh, sense of alienation, of confusion, of uh, estrangement from the adult world. Yes, and I think there are. I think there are a lot of uh, a lot of. There's another great French novel, Le Grand Môme by Alain Fournier, which oh, is a, yeah. a similar book about <clears throat> you know kind of that. A wistfulness of adolescence you know um I, I i i think i love this girl but how do i possibly let her know you know uh, it's uh, all these sort of emotions if they're if they're written well you know s strike a chord and strike a response in the reader and that's what i think uh takes makes you want to read more and and, and read more by this particular author and so on but and as you get older of course that be as i say that becomes a, a much more sophisticated kind of uh, demand that you make of the of the authors you select but uh, <clears throat> at the beginning i think uh, it's i mean I, the first book i remember reading for example was uh, rudyard kipling's jungle book mm. um and i my my mother told me i was about five or six when i was quite a, an early reader but of course it's set in the jungles of india and i was living in the uh, tropical rainforest of of west africa um, and so the world of Jungle Book was completely you know, outside the, the front door in a way. And so um, I would wander into the, into the bush, as we called it in, in West Africa, thinking I was a kind of Mowgli figure, you know, wondering if I would, <laughs> if I would encounter some animal or other. And, and so, again, there's the same uh, recognition that this is somehow true, or this, this conforms uh, with my limited experience of life and uh, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. As you said, you were, you, you were, well, you were born in, in Ghana, actually, weren't you? Yeah, you were yes, yes. A, your, your father was a doctor. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then you were, you had this slightly peripatetic, very peripatetic sort of existence. You were sent back to England to be educated. You went to Gordonston. Uh, we've had yes, a lot of Scotland. Yes, yes, with, uh, with yes. <laughs> Was that the making of you? Nobody's perfect, Mick. You know, um, but uh, <laughs> um, no, it, it was it was interesting. It was culture shock because um, I was, you know, I was born in Ghana and I grew up there, went to school there. Uh, but all all kids in those days were sent back home to boarding school at a, at a certain age or tender age of of nine or ten, and so it was something that you knew was going to happen, um, and you kind of were prepared for it. But in in my case, it was. Um, it was a it was a shock. I mean, I hadn't I hadn't ever been in a snowy landscape until I was ten years old. You know, I was like mm. some alien. I wandered out into the snowfield, picked up this strange white stuff uh, that had fallen from the sky, and um, and of course I was at school, and it's a uh, it's not like real life. It's got only one sex, for example, um, and then I would go back to Africa in the holidays. So. My school days, which lasted almost a decade, were a kind of strange experience, you know, implanted or embedded in what I regard as my real life in, in West Africa. And mm. it wasn't until I went to university in Scotland that I actually properly began to live in Britain. Um, I always felt I was just visiting. 
Mm. And of course, school is school is not the kind of society you want to regard as uh, something you'd like to spend the rest of your life in. And mm. um, uh, you know, boarding schools of that era were were, were strange and peculiar environments and um uh, and brutalizing uh, environments in many ways yes and i've written i've written a, quite a lot about it I've written two films about uh the sort of uh social conditioning that you undergo inevitably and also the kind of um, random violence that's visited on you i mean uh wh Auden said you know um every every schoolboy knows about fascism because basically they live in a fascist state um at, at school uh, at boarding school and uh, it's true it was uh, it is it, it's uh, it's survival of the fittest or certainly was in 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 my day and um <clears throat> were you bullied you know, i wasn't bullied no i was good at games you know that was the great oh, the great get out of jail out. <laughs> yes um <laughs> uh, but uh, i the first film i wrote which was called good and bad at games uh, was about a boy who who was horrendously bullied at school and who, ten years later, sort of goes mad and decides to take revenge on his bulliers. Um, and I saw it, uh, and of course it was uh, just uh, random uh, mental and physical cruelty. It was just part and parcel of the of the environment. I mean, I caught the there's a wonderful book about uh, a socio sociologist wrote called The Hot House Society. It said boarding schools are hot houses. Um, they're not natural. They're not like the like the world outside, and um, sometimes a hot house can be a pleasant place to be, and sometimes it can be deeply unpleasant. Um, mm. But it's a it's a very curious education. There's no doubt about it. Mm. And uh, I found that when I left school, um, after nearly ten years in in this environment, I then said to my father, "I want to have a, a year off." There weren't gap years in those days. And he says, "Well, you can do something useful. You can have a year off." And so I went to, to, to live in France. I went to a, fr <clears throat> a French university uh, and in Nice, the Côte d'Azur, I'm not stupid, and um, uh, re-educated myself, you know, um, so, uh, as it were, became a, a, a citizen again rather than a survivor of this strange, <laughs> <laughs> strange world that I'd inhabited for a decade or so. I mean, I didn't have a, a bad time and I was, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, pretty well educated, but suddenly getting a perspective of on the life I'd been leading when I went to live in France for a year out of my culture no friends no family different language <clears throat> I looked back at what I'd gone through in the previous 10 years and I thought hmm, hang on there are some positives I can take from it but there are a hell of a lot of negatives I'd better try and eradicate the negatives well you've, you've spoken of, of, of this peripatetic life but, and, and, and of a sense of never quite fitting in and I wonder whether that in a way has been useful to you as a novelist, that sense of being able to watch from the sidelines, as it were. I mean, have you been conscious of yourself watching from the sidelines, taking notes, literally or, or, or mentally, and, and using those in your in your writing? Do you, do you recognize that in yourself? Yes, I, I do, actually. But I think it was very unconscious, you know, because um, I, and I, I, I did feel very at home in West Africa and in West African cities like Accra and Ibadan in Western Nigeria. <clears throat> I knew how they worked. I could go anywhere in them at any time of day or night, with absolute freedom. That's the wonderful thing about West Africa as opposed to other bits of Africa. There was no racial tension, it was totally integrated. And so as a, as a white boy, as a, a teenager, I was free to roam this extraordinary sprawling city. <clears throat> and, um, and I did, um, but, uh, so when I came back to Britain uh, or Scotland, I, I felt something of a stranger. You know, I didn't know how Edinburgh worked as well as I knew how, how Abaddon worked. And uh, so I think it's unconsciously I realised I obviously wasn't Nigerian or Ghanaian, but equally I didn't feel particularly British or Scottish uh, because I wasn't, at, I wasn't wholly at ease in uh, the country my parents had come from. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe that is a good thing for a novelist because you are looking at things and trying to understand things. Saying, that's not like this, or, or I don't. I see you have to behave like that here, and mm -hmm. and slowly but surely. And then the ambition to become a writer hits you at that moment of self consciousness, if you like. And I think that's the moment when everything changes and you start seeing the world through the lens 
of a, a wannabe novelist. Right. And wh what do you, where's your great source of raw material? Is is in that period of time before that moment of self consciousness arrives? And in, mm -hmm. in my case, it was around about nineteen or twenty when the ambition really heated up. Right. So my my first two the first two years of my life, in a way, in a way, are my first twenty years of my life are in a way the raw material I've been drawing on ever since. And of course, it was this curious, as you say, schizoid uh, existence that I was leading. Mm. And, um, and I'm sure that's been fantastically helpful to me as a writer, though I don't want to overanalyze it necessarily. Um, but I, I'm, aware of, I'm aware of my strange upbringing and how it's contributed to the way I see the world. I mean, there's, there's a clear sort of progression, isn't there, in, in your work from, from your early novels, which are quite 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 short and quite condensed uh, and, 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 and quite comedic. Uh, and then I, I think you sort of, you, 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 I don't want to say you hit on a formula, it's not a formula, but, but you hit on this idea of, of the big life, the life, across the, sp the life across the span of an entire lifetime, first of all with the new confessions and then with any human heart, uh, sweet caress is, is, is also the same. What, what, what drew you to that idea that, that you wanted to actually engage with somebody's entire life across a historical span, bringing in uh, actual historical figures, placing them in, in, in historical situations. I mean, in any human heart, mm. Logan Mount Stewart, a book I love and which I'm sure many of our viewers love. Logan Mount Stewart, of course, uh, uh, is there uh, dallying with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and, and Virginia Woolf, who incidentally also makes an appearance, of course, in, in Trio. Yes. You, you love introducing historical <laughs> characters, don't you? Um, yeah, where, I think... Where, where, I, Sorry, go on. No, I, I do. It's part of the let's make it real ambition, you know. So uh, <laughs> I sort of slip them in to give to add a little sort of whiff of authenticity from time to time. Um, but I think I, I, you know, it looks uh, there was no plan. You know, I, I had written um, uh, two comic novels and a, and a novel about uh, the First World War in East Africa. And then I, I had this idea for the new confessions. Um, and it's a very simple idea. Very often novels come from the simplest um, notions. I, I had spent a long time at, at Oxford University uh, not completing a, a PhD. And uh, so I had I'd done a lot, massive amount of research. And amongst my research was I, I read Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Confessions, which is mm. a, an autobiography. I mean, very self-serving autobiography, but an extraordinary document. The fact that it was written in the middle of the 18th century is amazing. It's completely honest. Um, and, you know, rampaging, egomaniacal um, self-justification goes on. But it's, it's got a candor about it, which is still, if you read it today, astonishingly fresh. Um, and so I had this idea and said, what would Jean-Jacques Rousseau be like if he was living today in the 20th century? That was the basic idea for the novel. Okay. And I thought, well, you know, egomaniac, paranoid, um, uh, artistic, uh, difficult, contrary. He has to be a film director, doesn't he? And so I thought um, uh, I'd write a novel, and it had to be a long novel because Rousseau's Confessions was the model in a way. So I took my 20th century Rousseau, who I called John James Todd, mm. and gave him the obsession of, the, of trying to film Rousseau's Confessions. But in, in so doing, I realized I had to write his life as Rousseau had written his. And thus the, this idea of the, what I call the, the whole life novel or the cradle to grave novel mm. was born. And um, I wanted to make it seem as if it was an actual autobiography written by this man, John James Todd, who you might have heard of if you were film buff. And so I made it uh, as real as I possibly could and it was a 500 page novel and he, he's not dead at the end of it. He's in his, in his seventies, but it does mm. cover his entire life. Mm -hmm. And what happened as a result of that was that I was aware that the response to this type of novel was different from the response to an orthodox novel. Um, I mean, even if you think of Dickens and Trollops and their huge novels, they, they don't cover the whole life. They cover maybe 40 years or you know many decades, but <clears throat> they don't do, the full cradle to grave they might do cradle to year 40 or something like that right. but i went the whole hog and um the response from readers to to this was that they had all the information about the character 
um, they knew everything about this character's life. And that meant that they, I think, they saw this character in a different way from the characters that they would encounter in a, an orthodox novel where you don't have all the information. You don't know what happened to Nicholas Nickleby after the end of the novel, but in, in the whole life novel you do. And so I thought I must try and do this again uh, <clears throat> and do it in a, a, another way. And that, was, that took me to um, Any Human Heart. And I, I chose the, not an autobiography, but I chose the form of the intimate journal, yeah. which is, which is the, I think, the closest literary form to the way we all live, you know, day by day, moment by moment. Mm -hmm. And we only, we only realize its significance with hindsight. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wrote a whole life novel in the form of an intimate journal. And, um, and the response to that, you know, backed up everything I thought I had learned from the new confessions. And, mm. um, and I think the journal form also, the confessional form of, a, of a, an intimate uh, journal aided that. Um, and so, you know, I realized I had sort of onto something in a way. <laughs> and I thought, it certainly well. I, and I had also written a very short whole life novel, which is my art hoax, Nat Tate, but that's only yeah. 80, that's only 80 pages long. Right. Um, uh, but then I thought, well, I've done these two, two men, I should really do a whole life of a woman. Um, cause I've written from the point of view of a woman, uh, several times. And I thought, and so he hence, um, a sweet caress and you know here's your scoop make the novel i'm writing now is a another whole life novel oh another, another 500 pa another 500 pager and it'll probably be my laugh because it lasts because it, it they they are hard work and okay. hence the piles of books okay. mounting up um but uh and <laughs> how, they how, do, far, how far into it are you will well i'm 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 well underway um and i i, I sort of uh, you know again i, I sort of want to finish it early next year. So I've probably got another, you know, six or eight months of, of writing. It's all figured out. I know, you know, I've got a got very detailed plan. I don't start, as I say, don't start on page one until I know the what the last page is going to contain. And right. um, um, and so I'm, you know, it's, it's a dogged, remorseless process. You just have to, I can write for about three hours a day and, uh, you know, for seven days a week, it, it gets done. But, um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on target. My publishers will be pleased to hear. So well, uh, it should uh, be out in, it should be out in October next year. All oh, being well, well, if we're well, still here. <laughs> and after that, we want the autobiography of, 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 of William Boyd, not the. American. Well, no, there's absolutely zero chance of that happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, now uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to uh, jiggle this and see if I can find the right view questions bear with me everybody uh, I, I i grew up in a in, a, in an age of uh, quill and parchment going, <laughs> not, not a high-tech journey uh, uh so this is from kathleen uh do you like do you have a lot more books in you ready to write also what makes you want to write another book i think you've answered the first part of that question what makes you want to write another book or any book indeed well i think um <clears throat> It's impossible to imagine doing anything else, you know, particularly at this stage of my writing career. I'm writing my 17th novel, uh, much to my amazement. Um, it's 40, over 40 years since my first novel was published. And it just seems so intrinsic to the business of, of you know, being alive that you're creating something. I mean, I do write lots of other things. I write lots of, you know, films and television. I've write, started writing plays. I write lots of journalism as well. Um, you know, I, I, I dreamt of being a writer when I was 18 or 19. Didn't know how to become a writer. And having become one, it just seems that um, it's the only thing for me to do. Um, and so I have lots of ideas for books and films and, and plays and so on and I write them down in notebooks um, but one of them uh, will seize me as I'm as I'm finishing another novel and I'm beginning to w wonder what I might uh, write next um, one of these ideas that I have you know that's it were like plane circling an airport waiting to land one of them will be called in and uh, and it, it will begin the process this the long process of of uh, invention, as I call it, which precedes composition, uh, begins. And uh, it makes me relax when I'm writing one novel to 
have a have a quite a clear idea of the novel I'll write next. Okay. How 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 long can I keep going? Good question. Um, I think uh, as long as as long as I can. There is no retirement, and uh, actually, um, I think that you know I uh, I think this idea that you've written your best work by the time you're forty is wrong. I think uh, uh, here I am in you know, I don't know Act Five of my novel writing career, and I feel full of ideas and full of energy and so i'll carry on uh, writing as you know as, lo as long as i can hold a pen um so uh it's uh it, you know it's just, just something that seems you know in impossible to imagine not doing you know and i think maybe that's a definition of of an artist you know that that apply to composers and and uh playwrights and <clears throat> and sculptors and uh, artists uh, it's something you do um and it's almost like breathing you know um it, you, you're constantly thinking about the book you're writing or something you might write and uh it's uh, informs every every moment of your waking life in a way here's an interesting question from juliet the switch to fiction for an, the switch to fiction for a non-fiction writer is famously difficult would you ever consider flicking the switch in the other direction in other words would you want to write in non-fiction well, I've written lots of non-fiction, of shortish non-fiction. Um, you know, I've I've written. I, I nearly finished a, a PhD thesis, for heaven's sake, on uh, uh, sort of three hundred fifty pages on on Percy Bysshe Shelley. Um, but um, I'm I'm not drawn to write. I've been offered the chance. Somebody said to me, "Would you write a biography of Kipling, for example?" And I thought about it for one second and said, "No." Um, but I do write a lot of non-fiction. Uh, in uh, I, uh, I've written a lot about you know, maybe more essays rather than uh, than books. Though I have collected a lot of my essays and journalism in in a, in a very thick book called Bamboo, um, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm compiling Bamboo too. So um, that's a sign of how much non-fiction I write. But I just don't have any desire to write at length. Because it's you know prevent me writing a novel, and right. so uh, so I am happy to write a three thousand word you know essay, but I don't want to write um, you know a, a whole book or a biography or a, a history or, or anything like that. So um, it's to do with temperament and inclination, finally. And um, there are writers who do both, and there are writers who who um, y you know move from one form to the other. But um, I, I'm I'm too many novels I want to write to be distracted by writing a book about something else, even though I'm very interested in lots of things, things but I don't want to write a book about them, I write an essay about them. Okay, uh, Patricia asks, which of William's books is he fondest of? Well, I have, yes, I have a sort of boring answer to this question, I'm, um, I'm afraid. I mean, readers have a totally different idea of, of which of your books they like best. Um, uh, but in my my feeling is it's always the book I've written last, right. and that's that's because I think it represents, um, if you like, my competence as a writer better than anything. I think as you write on, and as you get more experienced, uh, and as you become you know a better practitioner, the your your skills and the cr the craft you apply to writing a fiction. Um, you know mature and, and ripen and become better and so i always feel that if if you want to to know what my best writing is then read my latest novel and the, I, with a bit of luck i hope that the one i'm going to write next will be slightly better than that so i i i again because of the way i write i don't start a novel till i'm thought it all out I, there's none of my novels are runs in the litter, if you like. I, I don't disown any of them. I'm equally proud of I love all my children, as it were, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, however different they are, uh, they've all sort of, they've turned out pretty much as I wanted them to be. So um, I know that's not true of every novelist. There are, there are lots of novelists who, who don't like their third novel or their seventh novel as much as their, uh, you know, their 10th or their 15th. But um, I think if in, to answer the question that you know, firing on all cylinders. Um, if you want to know what what that's like for me, read the latest novel, and you'll get a, a sense of it. Okay, 
Uh, Kathleen asks an interesting question. Uh, she says, I was originally going to ask William if based on his, if he based his characters on people he has met, but he's almost answered that. Maybe he could elaborate a bit. And that reminds me of um, uh, a character in Armadillo, uh, where you have Lorimer Black eating a shepherd's pie, spiked with LSD. Yes. And I, I remember you once telling me that that was actually based on on a poor guy called uh, Dave, I think, uh, who you'd known. It. Yes, Dave, who you'd known at yeah. university, who'd done exactly the same thing. Tell tell tell, tell us that story, and and then and then. Yes, it was it's one of these one of these pranks uh, that uh, people got up to uh, in in the in the seventies. That it wouldn't wouldn't it be amusing to lace the communal shepherd's pie with LSD? Okay. Of course, <laughs> and this particular guy you know it completely and utterly uh, transformed his behavior patterns um and i always remembered it and I, I put it in a novel but to to answer to to answer the question um of course elements of your own life uh, filter into your fiction um but i'm not an autobiographical writer and i think you can divide you know the many binary divisions in in novelists and you can divide them into autobiographical and non-autobiographical. Philip Roth, for example, is clearly an autobiographical writer. Um, Graham Greene uh, perhaps isn't. Um, Muriel Spark perhaps isn't or sometimes is, but uh, I'm almost defiantly not autobiographical, even though I use places and I use situations that I'm familiar with um, as the background or as the inspiration for elements in my fiction. I'd much rather use my imagination. Uh, and I think that, curiously, I've discovered that if you've got a well-functioning imagination, the things you imagine um, are often incredibly close to whatever the truth is. Um, and, you know, I've never been a surgeon, for example. I've never operated on anyone, but I've written a novel about a surgeon. And, you know, surgeon friends of mine have congratulated me <laughs> on the authenticity of the emotions they experience as they pick up a scalpel. And yeah. I've, only I've only imagined it. And you know, I've never, obviously never been a young soldier in World War I, but I've imagined what it's like to mm. go over the top and things like that. So I think it's a, a, a crucial part of the kind of writer you are that if you, if you, if you make things up, as I do, you know, if I, I invent things, I, I send my imagination out to to see what it's like to to be uh, you know a, a young woman primatologist in the jungles of central africa um or um be a mathematician uh, all the things i obviously can't be or, or could uh, could never be but i can imagine what it's like to be them and i do a bit of research and i put it together in as plausible a way as i can and so i think that's what uh, that's where you know there there are elements of my life in all my novels, um, uh, you know, in in my penultimate novel, uh, Love is Blind, which is about a piano tuner, which mm -hmm. I manifestly am not, um, the places he goes in the novel are all places I either know very well or have visited and, and enjoyed the visit. So, I, you know, for example, a lot of the novel takes place in St. Petersburg in uh, at the end of the 19th century. And uh, it's an amazing city. I was very struck by it. And so my impressions of St. Petersburg found their way into the novel, but I had to do a lot of poring over street maps and photographs and so on to, to get it right. So there is a kind of trigger effect, if you like, mm. of your own life. But uh, in, in my case, it's very often layered over with so much fiction that it ceases to have any bearing on my autobiography. I think I think uh, uh, rubber rubber planters in in Malaya always used to fear Somerset Maugham knocking at <laughs> the right. door because they knew yes. that they end up in his neck yes. box in short stories. So so uh, people who you go to dinner with don't don't sort of live in fear that that you're going to uh, that they're going to be no, appropriated in some way. No, I th and I think also um, you know inventing characters again is a is a, you, you you sort of cherry pick details sometimes they're details from a film you've seen or a book you've read or somebody mm. you've, somebody you've seen on the on the tube or or somebody you've met or and and all, all this is grist to the the novelist's mill um and you know when i put real people in my novels of course i'm trying absolutely to get them as right as possible but the fictional characters are you know, I can't trying to think of a, you know Logan Mount Stewart, for example, to to mention him. Um, 
he's sort of loosely based on a bunch of English novelists, um, some of whom are com completely forgotten. For example, uh, the novelist William Gerhardi, mm -hmm. who was very famous in the 1920s. Um, Lawrence Durrell, uh, another oh, novelist. Who, yes, yes. Yeah. But, uh, and um, Cyril Connolly, uh, mm -hmm. not a novelist or wrote a novel, but their personal I found their personalities very engaging, the type of people they were. So they came together in a kind of amalgam and threw in a, you know, a uh, few ex extra bits and pieces and, and created Logan Mount Stewart. So you can see echoes of, of real people, but um, the, the the construct is is entirely individual, I think. Right. Um, Helen wants to know, how do you approach writing the experiences and feelings of your female character? Uh, very good question. I, and I have an, have an answer to this. And it was, um, I, I wrote a book of, uh, called Brazzaville Beach, which was the first novel in which I wrote from the point of view of a woman. And uh, I, I felt I had to do this because I knew I wanted to write about uh, chimpanzees and, and this event that had taken place in, in uh, what is uh, now Tanzania, I think. Um, and it was when I started doing my research, it was very interesting that all the world experts on primates, whether it's gorillas, chimpanzees, baboons or orangutans at the time were women. And I thought, how fascinating. I've got to write from the point of view of a woman. Uh, and of course, once you get that idea, you can't shake, shake it off. And then I started to fret about it and think, oh, how on earth can I do this? Am I not taking some terrible risk? Um, but of course, there are many examples of, uh, of uh, men writing from the point of view of women and vice versa. And I thought, how do I do this? And I thought, well, I'll ask all the women I know how would they feel when this happened or what would they do when this? And I realized that that, that was a completely preposterous notion. <laughs> and I decided because, because, you know, everybody's different and everybody has a different, uh, different answer. And I thought that the thing to do is to construct a personality to, to imagine what this woman who I called Hope Clearwater was like. And so I had a very clear sense of her, her nature, the type of person she was, which in a way has nothing to do with gender. It's, uh, it's uh, to do with personality and character. Mm. So mm. whenever I found myself in a situation that seemed a bit uh, gender related, instead of thinking the stupid question that a male novelist would think, you know, scratching his head, what would a woman do in this situation? I thought to myself, what would Hope Clearwater do in this situation? What would, uh -huh. that, type of, what would that type of personality do? How would she react? And of course I got the answer instantly because right. it's, it's in tune with her nature. And I think the same would apply the other way around. If you're a, a woman writing from the point of view of a man, forget all this nonsense that, you know, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, just uh, imagine the personality of the character and their behavior patterns will conform to that in a way that seems entirely natural. So that's my trick. And I've done it now four times and it seems to work. Uh, so it's ignore gender is the shorthand, you know, concentrate on personality. Um, now, somebody wants to know, let's see if I can find it. This is Barry wants to know, considering, con considering how many countries you've lived in, how come you have maintained a lovely Scottish burr? Can you answer that question? Well, I, I think, actually, I think that um, it, it's incredibly hard to lose a Scottish accent. And there are very, very few Scots who've done it, in fact. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a household. My Both my parents came from Fife. So in a way, it was natural for me to inherit uh, their accent. And um, uh, I, th I think I've always had this, this accent um, all my life. I never tried to eradicate it. Um, I can do I can imitate much stronger Scottish accents if required. Um, but um, it's just something that I think and you, as a Scot, you hear it in people's voices even when it's just the slightest trace, um, you can you can pick up that that brogue if you like. It's it's a very very hard thing to to get rid of entirely. And so if you're trying to do it, you'll probably fail. But if you're not trying to do it, then you know you you could have a, a slight Scottish accent for the rest of your life. It's been a real pleasure listening to your slight Scottish accent. <laughs> Uh, and so delightful to talk to you, and, and uh, I, I'm sure all our viewers would agree it's been a really interesting evening. Um, I think there was, uh, I think people were asked to uh, to, to, to answer a question about um, a, a trick question, 
uh, which was supposed to pop up on my screen, um, but it hasn't done. But I'll tell oh, you, oh, here we go. a 17th century English poet makes a surprising appearance in trio. Can you tell us who it is? And I'm pleased to say that mm, it's racking up, racking up. Uh, it's like 40, pointless, isn't it? <laughs> 40, 40, it is like pointless. 45% uh, of you have got the right answer, and it was Andrew Marvel. Uh, who is uh, the screenwriter credited on uh, Emily Bracegirdle. Not the <laughs> Andrew Marvel. Marvel from the, this is a modern yeah. Andrew Marvel. Yes. Um, anyway, thank you very much again, Will. And, and thanks to all of you Telegraph subscribers and to Penguin Live for making this event not only possible, but certainly from my point of view, really, really special. Uh, it just remains for me to, to say thank you again. And I hope you all have a very enjoyable evening. Thank you for joining us and goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks, Mick. Thank you.